name is Jim Slothman, and I am the president of the Wagner Society of Cincinnati. We'd like to welcome all of you, our guests, and our uh, Wagner Society of Cincinnati members uh, to our first ever panel discussion. Uh, we've decided to take on a very broad subject, the ring cycle of Wagner, a very, very enormous uh, undertaking and giant artwork. So uh, we're very excited to be able to share the expertise of this wonderful panel that uh, we have assembled up here in front of you. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we go further on. Restrooms are located just outside of the big door on the right hand side. There are two restrooms. Uh, the first one's just as you get outside the door and the second one is just beyond it. Uh, after we have completed uh, the panel discussion, there will be a reception for our panelists and our guests in the dining room area, which is right as you come in the front door straight ahead, and it has a fantastic view of the Ohio River uh, up here on this uh, uh, beautiful uh, precipice. Um, a little bit about uh, the Wagner Society. Uh, we were founded on the 13th of June, 2010, um, on the occasion of a presentation that was given at the German Heritage Museum, Wagner and his music, Die Meister Singer Revealed. Uh, I gave that presentation, and it was decided at that uh, presentation afterwards, hey, uh, this is a lot of fun, let's do it more often, why don't we start a Wagner Society, right? It's just like the old musical theater thing, hey, let's have a show. So we decided uh, that it was high time uh, to have a Wagner Society in Cincinnati, and so we have been moving forward ever since. The mission of the Wagner Society is as follows. The Wagner Society of Cincinnati's mission is to promote the study of the music of Richard Wagner and foster a greater understanding and appreciation of his works. Uh, we also um, promote this mission uh, by having lectures, uh, watching media presentations of Wagner operas and various Wagner-related material, uh, attending live performances of Wagner's music dramas, and we maintain a library of books uh, with about 70 volumes at the German Heritage Museum, which is where we hold our many of our meetings. And uh, we also uh, give, provide information to all of our membership on um, Wagner performances that are local, regional, national, and international as well. Uh, we are very pleased to announce, and this will be some, something uh, written by Jeanette Gelfand on this subject uh, in the upcoming uh, Inquirer, uh, we have just become uh, members of the Richard Wagner Verband International, based in Bayreuth, Germany. We're very excited. This is our acceptance letter, and we're very excited about that. Uh, which means that we will be uh, receiving information uh, from them now uh, on various events that uh, they promote all around, uh, one of which is an annual Wagner Congress, which is being held in Prague this year, but will be held in Leipzig, Germany next year in honor of the 200th anniversary of Wagner's birth in 2013 in May. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a year-long festival uh, in Leipzig and all over Germany. It's going to be quite the event. So uh, our members of the Wagner Societies, many of which are very interested in this, will be traveling uh, to Leipzig for a week and a half of uh, all kinds of fun and activities. But I've told them already that you know, you've really got to be careful with the beer. You, know, you don't want too many, too much fun over there. So we're very excited about that. I would like to uh, uh, recognize a couple of guests that are very special to us here. Uh, first of all, uh, Reverend George Hill and his wife Amy, would you please stand and be recognized? Let's give them a little round of applause here. They have uh, volunteered to uh, allow us to use their wonderful home theater for uh, our Wagner screenings. We uh, will be watching various operas and, and doing various little activities there. We appreciate their patronage in terms of uh, you, the use of that facility. Uh, we're very excited about it. We also have uh, Dr. Uh, Yong Yong Jo, who is a professor of, uh, of music history and the like at CCM. She is co-author of She is co-author of a wonderful book called Wagner and Cinema. I don't know, how many of you have read this book? Raise your hand. 
Well, I just ordered it on Amazon, and I'll share it with you later. Okay? And we are in the process of working out uh, with her a possible presentation in 2013 on the subject of Wagner and cinema. And if you, if you haven't already seen it, um, there's a great movie called Melancholia uh, that is just getting ready to release on the 16th of March. I've already ordered it, and it uses Wagner's music as part of a very uplifting and wonderful uh, 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 subject, which is the end of the world. Okay. So, you know, this, this is always how it is, right? There's always, there's always something a little more grim that could possibly happen. But it's a fantastic film, and, and it's, it's gotten a lot of great reviews as won some awards, so we're pretty excited about it. But not quite as excited as we are about our three panelists up here, our panel of experts, which we are going to delve into the subject of Wagner's Ring Cycle with. Uh, first of all, yeah, let's give them a round uh, first of all, we have Gustav Andreasen, and uh, he is a, 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 very, a very active opera performer in the opera world, has performed all over the world. Um, recently, uh, many of our members went to the Toledo Opera to see an event called Romancing the Ring, where he sang Wotan's Farewell, uh, and uh, did a fantastic job. Yeah, you may have recognized him, uh, you will recognize his voice when he speaks, because he was in Cincinnati Opera's production of Rigoletto as Sparafucile. Now that is a great name for a villain, is it not? Yes. What's your name? Oh, I just have to be Sparafucile. Yeah. <laughs> right, that could be trouble. Um, but he is going to be performing on March 18th uh, in the Rake's Progress, which is being produced by the Vocal Arts Ensemble and Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra, and he is playing Nick Shadow, another mysterious name. Uh, but let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> well, we are very fortunate to have Marcus Kishley here with us from the Cincinnati Opera. Uh, he is pro uh, currently in the process of producing the, uh, the Summer Festival, uh, where they will be staging Pagliacci and Johnny Skiki, Porgy and Bess, and La Traviata. And in his spare time, he goes around and concertizes as a solo piano player, right? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> and uh, the next person on the panel uh, is a, a, a well-loved uh, uh, opera expert here in the Cincinnati area. We are very proud to have him uh, as a member of our Wagner Society. And uh, he was recently... Uh, promoted to the position of presenter and opera historian by special appointment of the Board of Wagner Society. And uh, he has been involved with various projects uh, with the Cincinnati Opera. He also uh, has been writing a book about the ring and its motifs. Uh, he is very involved in the Cincinnati Shakespeare Theater and other Cincinnati arts organizations. The eminent Charles Parsons. <laughs> Have you taught there recently? Well, for the last 18 years, three. Okay. <laughs> so don't miss them because they're wonderful and very informative. All right. Now I'd like to start off our, our movement through this subject with uh, a, a quote from uh, a, a, a wonderful author, Thomas May, whose book, Decoding Wagner, an invitation to his world of music drama, I think would be a great way to, to kick off into the first round of questions. Uh, first, it starts off with a, a quote from Wagner in a letter to Liszt. Mark well my poem. It contains the world's beginning and its end. And I quote uh, Thomas May, the ring cycle stands apart, not just in Wagner's career, nor in music and theater history alone for that matter. It stands apart within the entire context of artistic ambition, since the turning point known as the Renaissance. Almost everything connected with it involves a paradigm shift. The ring's unprecedented duration, roughly 14 hours of music, spread over four days, has a counterpart in Wagner's nearly three decade long obsession with the project from genesis to full execution. Moreover, his plan led to a vastly expanded role for the orchestra, and a new approach to the poetry he developed for his texts. 
Extending beyond the work itself, the ring encircles an ambit in which Wagner went so far as to reimagine an entire society. For the ring was conceived not only as a radical departure from convention to be realized properly, its creator also insisted that a new kind of performer, theater, and even audience would be necessary. Yet for all its novelty, the ring invokes the primal mythic imagery of cosmic birth and death. Much of its impact relies on the familiar archetype, apocalyptic in scale, of change and renewal. Examples include the overthrow of the Titans in Greek mythology or the cycles of the Hindu Mahabharata. Even the unifying symbolism of the ring that confers power is just one manifestation of an ancient and recurring morality tale. Plato's anecdote of the shepherd Gijas who discovered a corrupting ring as recounted in the Republic is an especially well-known version which may in turn have provided the seed for the famous variant at the heart of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Ring. So, this is a vast and broad subject as you can see. And uh, I, we have uh, included in your packet here the biographies of our uh, wonderful panelists, as well as some information about the Wagner Society and patronage in the Wagner Society, as well as a sheet on suggested ring cycle study resources if you want to continue this vast subject on your own. I would highly recommend this uh, Wagnerheim.com which is an extensive study by Paul Heisey of The Ring, which includes MP3 music samples and written musical references by Wagner, as well as Feuerbach, the, uh, uh, the famous uh, philosopher that influenced The Ring greatly, uh, and uh, of course the entire libretto. So, that's for your information as well. Now, I would like to start off by asking the first round of questions to each of our wonderful panelists. Then, after we've gone through this first round of questions of mine, we will open it up to all of you out there to ask your questions. Uh, we'll keep the subject as closely as we can to the subject at hand, and that is Wagner's Ring Cycle that accompanies the four operas that are contained therein. But we have an expert on production of opera, we ha who happens to be from Munich, by the way. He loves seeing this, this tablecloth. You know? <laughs> he understands that Without Ludwig of Bavaria, and without, in the least, his vast Bavarian treasury, there wouldn't be a ring cycle. Uh, there wouldn't have been any way, probably. So, uh, uh, we're wonderful. it's wonderful to have him. We also have this a wonderful expert on, on singing, uh, who has actually sung uh, these Wagner roles, and we have Charles, who knows just about everything there is to know about Wagner, in my opinion. So, my, I direct my first question to Charles Parsons. The Ring is an enormous artwork encompassing 15 hours or more in total. Being an expert on the piece, what books would you recommend for someone just learning about The Ring? And what do you find most challenging about the piece? <laughs> well, I have brought with me today a small show and tell. These are some of the <clears throat> basic tools that you might like to uh, be interested in, depending on your uh, musicality, I suppose. But what do we need to know about any piece of music, any opera? Let's just confine it to opera. The story. What's it all about? After all, Wagner referred to his operas, his music dramas. He wanted to tell a good story and to accompany it with really fine music that reflects what he is doing. So that's where you start. What's this storyline? What's the best way to do it? We have a book here. Uh, can you reach that one right there? Yes, Jim. Which I highly recommend. Uh, by Homan, I think it is. Uh, which will tell you about the story and background, that kind of thing. Would you tell us the name of the light from the window? Oh, sure. This is Wagner's Ring, A Listener's Companion and Concordance by J.K. Holman. You can check these out after the program. Um, but even more important than just someone telling you the story, you need to know what the words are going on. 
Wagner had a great interest in words. In fact, I believe he invented any number of words, sort of like Shakespeare, especially for his words. Uh, perhaps he's not the best poet in the world, but he certainly knew how to choose colorful words to tell his story. Therefore, you need a libretto. Everybody knows what a libretto is, I think. It's just simply a book, libretto, meaning a little book, which in one column has the original German, then the English translation that goes with it. Sit down with a recording. You can get a recording from the library. Sit down, first of all, read what the story's about, then listen to it, hanging on every word with the libretto. If you're really up to it, then you can graduate to a vocal score. You can get those from the library as well, piano vocal score, the kind of score that a singer like Gus uses when he learns a role, which is the piano accompaniment, the orchestra reduced to a piano accompaniment, and the vocal lines. Uh, get one that has both the German and an English translation with it. That'll help you too. Best of all, perhaps, we have back here in the corner a video. This is the James Levine Metropolitan Opera. Uh, version of the Ring Cycle, which is now no more, but uh, is world famous. People would come around from around the world just to see it because it was such a beautiful, realistic production. So that's what you need to get started. It's just what's it about and how do I listen to it? But then you can really step in some guam. Do we really need to know Wagner's association with the music. Did he intend something else? This was a question that I've avoided for many years, uh, but uh, just last fall, as you see in the Osher Institute for Learning and Retirement, I did an entire quarter about Wagner and his music, how they are associated. Uh, the point I'm trying to avoid at this point is the Nazi Association. We have to admit, yes, there was one. But how much do we need that to influence our appreciation of the music? I'm inclined to say, at least for the beginner anyway, or the novice, not at all. Don't worry that you've got this extra interpretation that Mima represents this, that Wotan represents that. No. Take it for just a beautiful storyline with beautiful music. Because remember, what happens at the end of this 14, 16 hours of music? The very last music you hear is one of the light motifs. The redemption of the world through love. That's what it's all about. I mentioned light motifs. Uh, Wagner invented this system of music in which he applied to objects, to people, to emotions, uh, a little tune, shall we say, a little musical tag that identifies them. That once you get those into your head and you can apply them, it is amazing how Wagner can surprise you. In Gettendermer, there's an instance where uh, Brunhilde can, cannot figure out how Siegfried has suddenly gotten the ring that she had thought was stolen by Gunther. But in the orchestra you hear this little theme that Wagner applies to the magic helmet, the Karin helm. And it's like, oh right, and she hears it in her head just as we hear it in the audience. We go, ah, oh, that's how that son of a bitch got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful little moments like that that just so come alive. So, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, the big thing here in the middle is a book that I'm working on uh, on the light motifs. This is, this is just simply a huge volume of photocopies of the themes themselves. There's going to be a lot of commentary that goes with it. You don't have to know those themes, uh, but it's, it certainly helps if you do. But don't worry about it if you don't. Uh, a wonderful introduction to recording is this little one right there. You can't see it from there where you are, but it is three CDs worth of analysis of the ring cycle with musical examples by Derek Cook, who was a wonderful authority on the music and began a book on the ring cycle called I Saw the World End, but unfortunately he finished, did not finish it, he died. 
But there are so many things that can help you along the way. The library is one of them. Go to the library, find one of those librarians that maybe even likes Wagner, <laughs> and they can recommend, if they can't recommend, they can at least point you in the right direction to uh, what you need to help you along. So that Okay, very good. Excellent. Let's give them a round of applause. Now, as, as testimony to the power of the ring, uh, I got to spin this little story at you. Uh, and it's a personal story about my own fate, as, as it were. Um, Carol Ann, Mary Slavman, my wife, who's sitting back there in the corner, who's our secretary, uh, and for, I guess, how many years did you perform in the cars at the Cincinnati Opera? 22. 22 years. And so, uh, when, the, when the Met produced the, this ring cycle, uh, and it was published, it was on television. Yeah, I think you all remember when that came out. It was sort of a landmark thing. I, I you know, well, there I was at home. She's at rehearsal endlessly. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with my time? I know. I think I'll watch this Wagner thing. Well, I had heard all these rumors about Wagner being this kind of creepy guy. And, and I thought, well, I don't know if I even want to watch this. Well, what the heck? Give it a whirl. Well, I was mesmerized. For four nights, remember F. Murray Abraham was, was the announcer at the beginning of the thing. I was mesmerized. I watched this thing for four nights, was totally bowled over, and resigned myself to a lifelong study of this very incredible art. Well, I sit here in front of you as president of the Wagner Society of Cincinnati, living testimony of the power that once it gets sort of into you, and you start to see the expansiveness of this art and where it can take your consciousness that you really um, uh, are a changed person. So uh, let's go on to another person who is changed by music, and that is our wonderful Marcus. Marcus, I will pose this question to you. Having worked on numerous opera productions in your career, what would be the most challenging aspect of staging such an enormous artwork? How hard is it to find qualified Wagner singers today? Marcus. I think first you have to take it apart the question whether you're staging the whole ring cycle or just pieces from it. Pieces from it are a challenge in themselves already because of the length, the duration, the orchestral forces involved, and uh, let me just sort of read them to you real quick. Uh, just on the string section, you need 16 first violins, 16 second, 12 violas, 12 celli, 8 double basses. That is, that's enormous. That is absolutely enormous. Then, in addition to that, for Rheingold, you have 7 harps. Uh, on, the, on the breast brass section, you're dealing with 8 horns, 3 trumpets, 1 bass trumpet, which wasn't even invented prior to that, 4 trombones, two tenor tubas and two bass tubas and one double bass tuba. The brass section alone is about the size of a Mozart orchestra. <laughs> then for Rheingold, in addition to have, you have three groups of tuned anvils. <laughs> the, the, the main question is, where do you put all this stuff? <laughs> and, and how do you coordinate all this? And how do you rehearse all that? Those are some major challenges. Um, then if you do the whole thing, the whole ring cycle, Wagner intended this to be a challenge, and to this day it's still a challenge. With all technology it doesn't change things all that much. Really. Finding singers was a challenge for Wagner then. He looked all over to find his Siegfried and Siegmund, and then the guy died right before <laughs> the performance. And he was, he, was, he was devastated because he thought, we looked so, so long for a person who can actually sing this. So the challenges that he had then, we still face nowadays. Of course there are singers who can sing it, but it's, it's, it's a major challenge and it has not stopped to be a challenge. Uh, throughout all these years, it has not changed, really. Um, Wagner required a tremendous amount of focus from all aspects involved in producing opera, including the audience. And so that led him to, to postulate that not only can we not produce it in the current opera system, which is the repertoire theater house that produces different operas every night? He thought that was a travesty. 
It was not suitable to produce his works of art at the quality that he needed. He required more focus from everybody involved, from his scenic artists, from his orchestra, from his audience, from his singers, from the producers. Uh, everybody was in the current system that he found around him inadequately prepared to produce this kind of artwork. And so he, he, he said very clearly when he published the libretto, which he did several years before the Rings of Terror was produced, I think it was in the early 60s, when he published the entire libretto, the music was not written at that point yet, but it came with a preface. And in that preface, he already outlined completely what it would require to produce this art. And it includes every detail about what Bayreuth was going to be and what it needed to be in order for this art to be produced. And it, it spoke very in great detail about not only needing all the performing forces to come together from disparate sources, bringing the best people to come together in this festival setup. But it also required the audience to come with an open mind to it and not just go to work in the day and then for some, you know, mindless entertainment go to the opera at night and see some random show. It required focus and, and preparation to receive this artwork in order for it to change you as a person and also change everybody involved in the process. It, he felt that by the involvement in the ring cycle, in the work for it, he would create a better and better prepared set of stage professionals that would then go back to the other theaters where they came from, better musicians, that through having gone through the focus period of rehearsal will go back and bring these sharpened and heightened skills back, back to, their, to their previous jobs and work. And in a, in a way, we're, we're still struggling with that when it comes to producing the ring cycle because of the incredible challenge it, it still poses. And I think one of the biggest ones has to do with the scene changes. That's just one of them. I don't, I don't even know which one to really call the biggest one. I mean, they're all really big deals. <laughs> but if you produce the whole cycle and not just one at a time, then you're dealing with enormous amounts of scenery because the awesomeness of the music requires some sort of balance in the visual component. So, generally, designers tend to create relatively large sets for this piece to, to counterbalance the music. But then, as in Meistersinger, in the Act 3, when you go from the Schusterstube to the Festwiese, and you only have a set number of bars to accomplish this change, you have the same here in this, in this piece. You have act changes, but you have scene changes within each act. And sometimes the changes from one scene to the next are very drastic, and they have to be accomplished with a certain amount of time that you have that's prescribed in the score. And if you don't make it, then, you know, everybody will see it. So, for these set changes, suddenly you need to bring vast amounts of manpower to the stage to accomplish them in the amount of time. If they were just between act breaks, you could do it at a leisurely pace while people get dinner. But here you can't. You can't. You need to accomplish it in a certain amount of time. And that's, in a way, that's almost a metaphor for how everything is with Wagner. He knew his... He knew his skill extremely, extremely well, and he was very aware of what he was doing and what needed to be accomplished and what challenges he would pose. And in, 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 in this case, the scene changes alone are of massive, massive proportion, and they need to be accomplished very, very fast. And that's one challenge that can still to this day, except for the production that you maybe saw at the Met that has this really great machinery. Stuff needs to be hauled around by people, and that requires manpower now as it did then. And um, so I think it all goes back to the general proportion of this piece, the, the giant scale of it that still makes it difficult today. Is that the roundabout answer? Oh, no, that's very good. That's very Let's good. give him a round of applause. <laughs>
Yeah, it seems to be something I'm going through right now, in fact. Uh, you know, I, I uh, was, uh, had a fest contract when I was in my early 30s at Deutsche Oberbank Gein. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but they were interested in me doing the role of Wotan, kind of grooming me for the role to see if I could do it. Uh, which was one of the reasons I ended up leaving. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a scary role because it's so long. Or at least I, I, I figured it's, it's so long. I mean, I, I've uh, heard uh, James Morris talk about uh, the length of Valka, and uh, he spends so much time screaming at the ladies during the most famous scene, and then you have to go on and sing another humongous scene and then sing something very lyrically. <laughs> But there, weirdly enough, there are a lot of breaks in there. And so uh, they had me sing King Philip. And I, I did that four years in a row there. And uh, also in Hamburg, Schatzhofe. And uh, it's funny because uh, I, I left and I, I, I thanked them for their time. And uh, I didn't think much about the fact that King Philip has the exact same range as Wotan. Uh, now, and I've actually sung through King Philip twice. And the more I sang it, the easier it was to sing those high notes. So it wasn't that much of an issue. The most challenging note was a C natural, middle C, which is the most challenging note for my voice. Um, a lot of people that sing Wotan, the most challenging note is maybe a D natural. It's not, it's not the high notes. In fact, uh, I was in Aspen one time, and this man came up to me, uh, a, a, a relative of Wagner's, apparently, um, an old man. And he said, he said, uh, he thought that my voice would be good for Wotan. And then again, I went, oh, well, I, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, and we talked, he talked about the role. Now, I hadn't really, really looked at the role. When I was in undergrad, uh, a, a, a professor said, you have no business looking at, and I was, of course, working on the album, like in this part, uh, the, the, the Wotan's Farewell uh, aria. And you have no business learning this. I, you know, thinking back, he probably had no business telling me that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, they say that you know when you learn music when you're younger, uh, it, it sticks with you better. All right, so 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 this is my journey here, and so I I, I did take in what the guy said because the guy definitely knew a lot about Wagner, and uh, uh, and he did. He's the one who informed me about the F sharp being the highest note. And he also talked about Wagner wrote in such a way for Wotan, not necessarily for Hagen, but he wrote in such a way where there's a lot of piano. There's, there's a lot of moments where it's just deeply heartfelt, rich. It is as low as Zarastro. It's a low F. Uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of the role is middle voice um, for a bass. Now, the term bass baritone came from this role. This role, uh, Fly Dutchman and uh, uh, the Hans Sachs, which I will never do. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the long one. All right. Okay, so um, I, I got to, I, you know, certainly I've done bass baritone roles, um, and, and I've, I've, I've sung uh, Carlo Floyd Susanna. I did the 50th anniversary, and Carlo Floyd came backstage, and he was very complimentary. He said it was one of the best blitzes he'd heard in some time, in quite some time. Which was, which was really touching, but that is called a bass baritone role. Um, and uh, Nick Shadow is considered more of a bass baritone role. I was doing that in Toledo, and uh, Maestro Conlon uh, came up to me, and he said, I'd like you to consider doing Botan. And again, I was like, no, I, I really, and, and I thought, well, if it's just one scene, then I, yeah, I could probably sing it. Okay, so then we're rehearsing that, and I, of course I want to sing it incredibly well, and so I sing it, and I coach it for an hour. I'm singing it over and over again for an hour. And it struck me, <laughs> and this is getting easier the more I'm singing it. And so I sang for another half an hour, which is more than Wotan sings in Valka, which is the longest one that he does. So I thought to myself, if this is something that I can do, I can sing this portion for the amount of time that Wotan sings for the, for the big evening, what makes this so incredibly difficult? And I thought, I've sung King Philip twice. I, you know, you, usually when you have a coach and you coach for an hour. Uh, so I, 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 I've decided that I'm gonna pursue uh, learning this role and getting it into my voice. Now that's just the first step. 
Uh, the only way that a person can know when they're actually going to be able to perform this role is when they're actually performing this role. <laughs> the only way. Uh, and I'll give you two stories. There's a guy named Greer Grimsley who took a year off just to learn the role. Perhaps, in my opinion, the best voice for Votan out there. Um, people will argue that Brent Turfle is more musical, and, and that's probably true. I mean, he's more of a leader singer, I and mean, it's a very light, light version of Votan. Uh, Greer Grimsley is just the strongest voice I think I've ever heard uh, for the role. And uh, my first choice. Um, he took a year off and worked on it and didn't give Seattle Opera an actual answer until he really, really had it. And I was there for his first um, performance with the orchestra. Uh, at first, it was the final dress rehearsal. And of course, Stephanie Blythe and he, the two largest voices probably in the world, were like yelling at each other. And then he made it through Siegfried, and I saw him on the street, and he was having a hard time talking. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> But it was just the final dress, and he, he took it back a notch. And the, the challenge with the role is the same thing as this other story. A guy named Malcolm Smith, who only did it once, he learned the role, a very, very, very good singer, very smart. Listening to him is like a voice lesson. He actually uh, found that he, he had done the bass roles in the ring, and he thought the same thing I'm thinking now. Uh, it really isn't that high of a role. And most of the high notes are there's plenty of rest time before you sing it. And then you have plenty of uh, rest after big sessions as well, if you're smart. Uh, and you have to be in good voice. So he, he actually did it, and he did it to a great success. And there was an agent from Europe who heard him and said, you are going to be singing this everywhere. I'm going to book you everywhere. And he said, no. <laughs> Uh, well, he had a fest contract with Deutsche Wolfram Rhein, the place where I was fest. And uh, he, uh, he knew that uh, for longevity of his career, which he's probably still singing now, I believe, he's in his 70s, uh, coming up on his late 70s, actually, and he's still singing. Uh, and I think that's what he was going for with his career. A lot of Wagnerians stop around 60. Uh, Kurt Moll stopped at 65. So uh, there's, 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 there's two stories, and I'm just beginning my journey, so that I, I guess that's the best I can do for you. <laughs> okay. So wonderful. Okay, now I'd like to open up uh, uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, if you would please stand. Ask your uh, uh, question. If you want to identify who you are, I guarantee you'll be safe in this crowd. Um, and uh, you remember, you have three tremendous experts up here: Marcus, Gus, and Charles. And uh, if you'll uh, direct your your uh, question toward one of them, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Kraining, and this question is for Marcus. You mentioned that there were difficulties sometimes in the production of uh, a Wagner opera. Okay, you started mentioning that, um, I mean, just with the instruments and everything. This brings me back to when we had uh, Meister Singer here in Cincinnati. We had um, <laughs> simply, I mean, the leading roles change, the conductor change. We have this fantastic um, stage that you brought, that we got things, and I would see we because we are in Cincinnati. That Cincinnati <laughs> Opera got, thanks to your contacts and everything, that you got it from Düsseldorf. If I Actually, the house where he used to have a contract. Exactly. Yeah. I recognize it. And so we were very lucky to have that amazing stage. And then, against all odds, it was one of the most beautiful opera seasons that we had, and starting with the Meister Singer, which was fantastic. Although we changed, I mean, almost everybody of the leading roles. So that was just because it brought back that, what you said, all the difficulties. So I don't know if you would like to elaborate a little bit more on that Meister Singer production and the difficulties or if that. Uh, sure, it's taken us a little bit off topic, but uh -huh. um, really quick. Uh, you obviously know that James Levine has had a spell of really bad health issues. And so when he dropped out, a lot of other performers dropped out along with him. Mm -hmm. And so we had to replace them. And the difficulty with that is that a piece like Meistersinger, which is so long and so rarely performed in this country, it's hard to find performers in this country that perform the roles. 
And therefore, a lot of those performers come from Europe, and that requires getting visas, mm -hmm. which, because of the whole Homeland Security stuff, has gotten more and more complicated over the years. And so, uh, complication that means, in that case, means it takes longer to accomplish getting a visa. Mm -hmm. And um, with those late cancellations, it made things very nervous for us if we can get the performers in the country that can actually sing the roles. And, um, but you know, as with everything in, in producing an opera, it, you know, you just have to keep working. You, you, you need to persevere. You know, failure is not an option. And we just had to keep pulling rabbits out of our heads until nobody wanted a fresh rabbit. <laughs> Phoenix production. <laughs> I was thinking, thought it was magnificent. It was a triumph. Absolutely a triumph. You know, sometimes I think that but the, the, the spontaneity required of being really a creative problem solver can yield a tremendous amount of sparkle. And, and you yes. certainly, you certainly and, did. Um, you know, and the performers that were with us also realized how hard we were working to keep this together, not fall apart. And uh, there is a certain energy that rallies behind that that perseverance. Um, that really, I thought, made it a really special situation. Also in the rehearsals, it was, it was very collegial. And people just said, oh, well, if you don't have that performing yet, well, you know, there was this one guy who sang our oh, David, Norbert Ernst, oh, I love him. He is one of those musical geniuses who knew every role in the piece, from memory. And he could even conduct the piece. I've never met anybody like that. He was so well prepared. He has done 35 performances of Meistersinger in that role, David. And at some point, he even had to sing Walter von Stolzing, which is really not his voice type. Um, but uh, when we were short of Beckmesser, uh, he, he came up to me and said, Marcus, I, I can sing this role for the rehearsal. <laughs> and, and so he was doing alternating. <laughs> and in the big scene in, in the act of Act Two, uh, the end of Act Two, where, every, where this big fight erupts on stage, um, for a while, I was actually doing Beckmesser, sort of just using the, the loop here and playing along until he came after me with that big club. And it, it made for a really hilarious rehearsal period. So in the end, with all the hassle that we had to, and all the hoops we had to jump through, it really turned out to be one of the, the most memorable and, and finest moments I thought. We were very, very happy with it. Got to like it. Thank you. Yes. The, uh, uh, interesting enough, we, over the course of the past two years, the Wagner Society of Cincinnati has, has been focusing on studying the ring cycle uh, in that we pr uh, presented presentations on all four of the ring operas and, of course, pr just prior to the HD Live from the Met broadcast. So we would hear a presentation, um, I would show a PowerPoint and do some musical ep excerpts, then we would have a DVD and Charles would go through and analyze the various scenes and really point out the most important ones. And then we would go see it live at the Mets. It was, it was we were in, enmeshed in, in, in the piece and that whole Met production, which had its own drama, referring back to your question, um, when all of a sudden the Siegfried, uh, they, what, what, there were two that, that, that canceled. And, and so they bring this guy in uh, who had done it in San Francisco and he's like, I don't know, it's pretty hard. <laughs> when they interviewed him, he was the, they showed him after rehearsal, he, he went and just crashed down on his sofa in his, in his room, and he was like, oh, that was hard, that was hard, that was hard. <laughs> you know? But, but it, it was like art imitating life, imitating art, right? And, then we were, and we were watching this because after, you know, you watch an act, they have the... Uh, you know, scenes about uh, what has happened to the artists and what's going on with the sets and all these other things. And so we actually watched that scenario unfold of uh, the desperation. And, you know, Gail and all of them were like, oh, oh, oh thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. You have to keep in mind that there's so many people and so many things involved in, in getting a production to actually work out and come to a successful performance. All of these elements are totally outside of our control. You know, I mean, our lead performer can be hit by a bus by walking across the street. I mean, what, what do you do then? And then the fact that things actually work out for the most part is almost a miracle. <laughs> um, but um, getting just, just for one second, real quick, getting back to the, the difficulty of singing these roles. 
uh, Wagner was not entirely oblivious to this, even maybe just somewhat oblivious. Because in the design of the theater in Bayreuth, he had the entire orchestra almost entirely covered. And so if this is sort of the, the stage area here, and where you are as the audience, the orchestra is underneath, and only, there's only a small opening where the conductor can look out onto the stage. The actual sound from the orchestra comes from the back. Uh, there's a reflective wall and an opening at the back of the house, at the back of the theater. So the sound comes up from, from underneath, up, and then out into the audience. So the, the singers are like, you know, these are your singers right here. And so the orchestra sound comes from behind them into the auditorium. And that takes away some of the immediate punch of, of the, these incredible orchestral forces and, and softens that a little bit. And then he intended that to be that way so that singers don't have to scream their lungs out. They still do it though. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it's just like less a degree. Yeah. I, 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 there's on YouTube, there's, um, uh, you can watch a, a, a little excerpt with Wolfgang Wagner explaining the acoustic at Bayreuth at the Festival House. And he says, after the, the blend of orchestra and voice goes out, it goes up high. And the top of the Festival House, because they didn't have any money to do plaster and all this nice work that they wanted done, it, it's all rafters covered with canvas. So it literally bounces up and then back down through the canvas and resonates like a violin in the whole room. Uh, I had, I, we had at one of our presentations, one of the uh, uh, Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra members who uh, was allowed to go over and see a production of Parsifal there uh, when she was younger. And she told me that the house goes completely to black. You can't see your hand in front of your face. Suddenly this music comes rising out upon you. She said it's, it's like coming down and then it like comes out of you. She said it was the most incredible spiritual experience she had ever had in her life and that it, she felt like she had lost all orientation, up, down, backward, forward. She was this floating in space person. Now, that, that's a pretty incredible thing to accomplish with, with, with music um, and design. But, but that, that is exactly what Wagner set out to do, and actually accomplished. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing to, to, to understand that not only did he change everything about producing opera, and required things that were unprecedented at that point, but he had a clear ideal in mind already, and knew how to accomplish it, and got it done. That's, that's pretty significant. Yeah. And the Wagner Society is in 1870 were formed to help raise the money to create the Bayreuth Festival. And that was their initial function, was to raise money to be able to uh, help build the theater and to create the festival. Uh, and that was part of the reason why they did it. So, okay, great, fantastic, thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, this, my name is uh, Gene Sanger. This is a question for all three panel members, and I don't know They'll have to work out the order, but um, what we have today is just another representation of the tremendous amount of research and study and loyalty and, and fealty and devotion to Wagner, his concepts, his ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, but um, we discover when we look at the ring that he uh, envisioned it as a prologue and three nights to be performed in four consecutive nights. When it was first performed, the first and third ring were performed in four consecutive nights. In the second ring cycle, there were, there were breaks. But when we have this tremendous fealty to all things Wagner, why do, what are the factors, because I will acknowledge them, but I want to hear the experts say what, what they consider the factors to be that we say, well, we don't have to do the ring in this kind of staging. I would like to add, um, if anybody knows when the ring, other than at the uh, first performances, and uh, by the Kirov Opera in 2007 in New York City was performed in four consecutive nights. I've been able to find it anywhere else, and I've been looking for years, but maybe the, the panel knows. But I'd like to know, 
why do we cast this part of Wagner's legacy aside and any opinions as to what you think it means, uh, you know, one way or the other, whether it's important or not, that that be respected, what you would envision if you were able to see it or if it were presented that way? It's a reasonable, simple question. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, from a singer standpoint, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain I wouldn't be able to sing uh, many nights in a row. Uh, vocally, I, I, I mean, uh, 40 hours took for my voice to recover and uh, get stronger. It's, it's, like, it's like training for a marathon. Um, and so you've run a marathon, you need you know, time to recover from that. Uh, so that, that's why I think that's probably one of the main reasons is that the singers, uh, probably most of them, are, with the, maybe the exception of Perry Grimsley, who always sings out, and never marks. Uh, I, I can't think of too many singers that could do that every night. And even him, I, I think that it would, his, he would suffer eventually. And from the audience point of view, things have really changed what Wagner intended was when you go to see the ring, that's all you do. Mm -hmm. uh, that you would come to Bayreuth, it would be an occasion, a holy occasion even that everything, even during the day, was addressed to simply seeing the ring in that setting. But now, people work, and a, a Tuesday Rheingold, I don't know how appealing that would be to many people. Even if singers were able to do it four nights in a row, the audience devoting four nights in a row, uh, it, it, I don't think it can really be done. Uh, now, when I saw the ring at the Met, it was spent, spread out over six days, uh, and it still clung together quite well. Uh, I was doing artsy stuff during the day, going to museums and that, so in a way, my mind was still focused on an art, but there's not many people that can just simply take off four days in a row and devote themselves simply to the ring cycle. Marcus, you have anything there? Yeah, well, there's certainly also financial considerations, and those have to do with um, your, your stage technicians, because you know you have the great length of the pieces themselves. They need to be set up prior to the performance. They'd be torn down afterwards, and you have to put in the new scenery for the following day and prep everything. So you're talking about really, really long days, and you know these people also go into overtime certain amounts of, after certain hours, and um, then these rehearsals or the scene shifts after the performances become very, very costly. Costs rise exponentially after a certain period of time. <coughs> and uh, you can avoid that by, by spacing it out a little bit more. And since the, the entire endeavor of producing the ring cycle is already not going to be cheap, every way in which you can keep it from going fully out of control would be very welcome. <laughs> subtly put, subtly put. Of course, then there's the tourism aspect. When uh, Carol Ann and, and, and Vicki and I went to San Francisco to see the ring, uh, I can't imagine not being able to spend a day in Napa Valley, uh, <laughs> Mendocino, <laughs> which, you know, I, I consider kind of part of it. I also saw it in Chicago, and yeah, I went to the museums and to great restaurants and things, and it was very quite leisurely. Um, in Bayreuth, you know, they have long breaks between uh, the various acts. And the concept is you go out into the beautiful greenery and trees and you, you sort of like have a little picnic and you discuss what you have just uh, seen and, and what, how it has affected you. And that was also conceived as part of it as well. Well, that's what we wanted to do for my designer. But then it turned out that the park wasn't ready to do that because it was still a big construction, construction site. The street wasn't ready. Um, you know, now these things would be more possible with the park being almost completed. I don't know if you've driven by, it's a big mess right now, but it's, I mean, if you, if you look at it from, from up from our windows, uh, where you can see over the entire park, there's been incredible progress made. So that, that park is ready to have these kind of breaks, very, very shortly. And that whole zone around there is, in, in a way, a vision that Eric Kunzel had that over the Rhine would be redeemed by art. 
that it was going to be the redemption of that the whole area that it would the, the history and and music and art would <clears throat> be the driving force that would turn everything around and it's interesting to see that part of that vision is actually happening as you said I, 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 I owe the man a great deal personally I'm a great believer in his dream and I'm, I will do my best to do <laughs> what yeah. I can round of applause for doing your best is that, is that helpful to your question? Well, yes, I mean, we, we saw it, and I would say, particularly in light of your talking about the um, CSO player who went to Byron, which I've never been to, and, and, you know, just being wrapped up, I've seen it both ways. And seeing it in four nights in a row, it was almost like it was completely different because it was so compacted. And it was, it, it was, it, I mean, it is a gigantic soap opera on top of everything else. And so you were really there. And it was like, even though you knew the story, I told, well, what's going to happen next? The singers cannot do it. They're, they trade in and out of the role. So, and that's been pointed out by all kinds of uh, illustrious, uh, uh, you know, elite names. Uh, the, the opera is, in my opinion, is so strong, the operas, the ring, that as long as you have good singers, it doesn't make any difference, nothing disrespectful, that you're seeing one singer sing Botan one night and a different singer sing Botan the other night because it's not about the singer, perhaps, it's about Botan. And it, it was just, uh, and to hear the, to hear the answers, um, Somebody went to San Francisco Ring and had the opposite effect. They said, by the time I added up all the costs of transportation, rooms, meals, the side trips and everything like that, the astronomical cost of the tickets, because it is such a monster, so the, the tickets were almost free, you know, because it's such an undertaking. In Los Angeles, did it with my Chicano, I think it was over nine days, give say eight nights. Uh, and, and it made it virtually impossible on the other hand. So, it's just interesting to hear the factors. It, it was a little bit. Thank you very much. If I may address another practicality, actually, I think I talked to Gus about this. Uh, emotion. Now, admittedly, Birgit Nilsson, who was extraordinary in herself, said the only thing you need to sing as old as a comfortable pair of shoes. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you need lots more. And uh, as Gus can, can tell you, just the sheer physicality of standing there and producing the sound. But what about the emotion that's involved? The last time Cincinnati Opera did Valkyrie was back in the 70s, I believe. And the man singing Votan was Noel Jan Tile, or Till perhaps, T-Y. He had never sung the role before. And his teacher was in Cincinnati to coach him with it at the last minute. And he said something to the effect of Noel, I'm going to pay for an extra orchestral rehearsal of just Votan's farewell so you can get the emotion out of your system. Oh. And Till said, oh, come on, yeah. Oh, no. He said, no, no, I'm going to do it. He did it, and Noel Jan Till was an absolute wreck at it, and he could do nothing but thank his teacher for doing that. He got to just let that emotion go. Because if you're too emotional, you can't sing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for one of the rehearsals with Toledo Opera, that music started, and I did. I, it was very, very challenging for me to, to get through it. And it wasn't for vocal reasons. I had to, like, totally cut it off uh, and try to pretend like I was being emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I was there at that performance of one of the great, oh, come on, moments. Gus had just sang Votan's last line. The orchestra is pouring forth this wonderful music. I'm here. Next to me is my friend Nancy. Next to Nancy was Gus's wife, Stacy Reshore. <laughs> the orchestra is pouring forth, and the woman leans over to Stacy and says, Is that your husband? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Stacy should have killed her right there. <laughs> Just as a final uh, a note, you know, Wagner was very much a revolutionary uh, in his mind. He originally had the concept of having the festival 
and, the, and producing the ring in, a temp, in like a sort of a temporary structure, give all the tickets were to be free, no one was to pay for anything, purely, uh, you know, uh, um, on the house, just the devotees would come, and then after the show was finished, they would burn the thing to the ground. Wow. And, and, which really would have had a tremendous impact. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes, please stop. I'd like to know what Wagner, apparently he, he had this idea from a long time to put this whole situation together. What do you think, and I know this might be a hard question, what do you think his focus was in trying to bring together such a tremendous and unusual piece of work? What, what was behind it? He, he knew a good story when he saw it. Uh, he, of course, wrote it backwards, so to speak. It was to be limited to just Siegfried's death, which he wrote first, and then he realized, well, this needs a lot of explanation, so he wrote the Junge Siegfried, the young Siegfried, to precede Siegfried's cult, which became Gata Nemero, and then he realized, well, this needs more explanation, so he did Die Valkyrie and Das Rheinbold. So it really started out as a comparatively modest project that just got bigger and bigger because he realized this is a good story that needs to be told. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, David. <coughs> Pardon me. My name is Dave Savant. Uh, I have a very broad question, uh, which you can tackle any way you want. Uh, history of production, particularly singing style and also production. Um, the question is basically, what's changed in the last 125 years? Uh, the, the world's changed a lot. Society's changed, history, technology. Uh, it's so every aspect imaginable. Well, what is it about opera, excuse me, what is it about the ring? I'll just, I could, use, I could just say the ring itself not the text has changed. Um, or another way, another way I could ask is what about production of the ring has changed and is it really about production solely because it also exists uh, in a book. But, um, so how has performance changed in the last 25, 125 years to reflect uh, the changes we've had in this world or have they at all? And, and uh, how does this piece of are stay current or need it stay current um, and, and uh, it addresses in terms of the skills of the performers or the uh, technology available or the, the, the needs of society to see uh, this piece of work in different ways that, that they, uh, as opposed to what they saw 125 years ago. So it's a broad question to tackle any way you wish. It, it's a very sore point with me right now. Something that's been going on for the last month or so. Uh, technology is the big new thing now. Uh, what would a ring cycle designed and saved by Steven Spielberg be like? <laughs> or George Lucas? Uh, but one still must remember to respect the composer. But that's the big change, I think. Uh, this is the age of the stage director now. How much concept, a word I hate, which do you put on to your production? Uh, you have to, be, to remember, the composer knew what he wanted, what he was writing about. Uh, the people will argue, well, we don't want opera to become a museum piece. Well, it is a museum piece in a way. Uh, and we love the Mona Lisa, we're not going to put a, a mustache on it. So uh, one of my favorite stage directors is uh, Michael Scavola who said to me personally, well, one can be creative without being ridiculous. So technology is the big thing about what one does with Wagner these days, because you have so many wonderful things at hand, but they're very expensive to produce, and not everybody can do it. Singing-wise, uh, the style has changed since the 1940s. Uh, prior to that uh, was something called the Bayreuth Bark, in which there was a lot of, I guess, staccato to it, more emphasis on the, uh, the uh, consonants and that kind of thing, where there was no real legato to it. 
And then you just bark the words. So those are two uh, big changes. Anyone else? Uh, I'd like to say something to that. Um, all we have of the ring cycle really is those four books that you see over there with those colorful covers and some writings of our that's 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 the actual stuff that we have that's off Wagner of the ring cycle. Um, music, unlike the Mona Lisa, is uh, an art form that lives in the moment and needs to be examined at the in the moment and produced in the moment. It does there's nothing that stays other than those printed pages. Um, every reinterpretation of it is always a reflection of the time around it in which it is produced. And so, unlike the Mona Lisa, it's, it's never the same. Nothing will ever be the same, except for the pages that make no sound on their own, they do not produce themselves on their own. It's always a reflection, a produced production is always a reflection of the times and the people around it. And so, in that regard, I think there is no such thing as a museum production, unless you really, really try extremely hard to produce that. It's always part of who's producing it and their view at that moment. I think that maybe in the most basic way one has changed about using the ring cycle. Um, I think projection design is a big one. It's used almost entirely in all productions. Projections are a big component of them. But even those are really not that new. You know, they're just different means by which they're being accomplished. Um, Wagner also used projection designs. They were just of an earlier form of a more, in a, in a way, crude shape. They still worked. You know, they still worked. They maybe could produce as many fancy pictures as we can do today. But they're still the same principle. You know, you use light to project something onto a semi-permeable or opaque surface. And so we use that to a greater extent now, and automation is a bigger component. Automation of scene changes, of scenic elements that are flown in and out at certain pre-programmed periods of time, which can also create enormous havoc when it goes wrong, because nobody knows on which rope to pull to make something happen. It has all to do with program. Um, but those two things in the production elements of it, I think, are the biggest uh, developments. But do they really change much about the artwork itself? I don't know, they're just a different, different tool to use. It's like a different brush that you paint different pictures with. Do you think the society has, takes different meaning from, from this? The, the I think they're essentially... Um, they or is that really just a minor? I think two big productions that you should become familiar with kind of are symbols for different schools of thought on how to produce this piece. One is, I think, very well represented by this DVD set that's over there, the, the Met production with uh, Otto Schenk and Günther schneider Simpson as scenic designer. By the way, Günther schneider Simpson also designed the Meistersinger production that we did in 2010, same designer. So there is that. The other one is the Patrice Chavot and Pierre Boulet's version. And the difference in the two of them is that I think the Otto Schenk and the Günther Schneider Simpson production go very much by what's written in the libretto, in the actual text, but what, what, what Wagner wrote about the actual action on stage. That's not part of the libretto, where he's saying these performers come from here and here, and this is what the stage looks like. And it's trying to recreate that in a very realistic and representational fashion. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own viewpoint. But the Patrice Chavon version is one that interprets more, that goes more about societal issues that are represented as a metaphor in this libretto. And, and <clears throat> if you go with something like the Aachen Fire version in LA, it's still very representational, but just with different pictures. So I think that the key issues, the key, the key separating points about different ways to produce this piece is are you interpreting something by saying that the text in the libretto is a metaphor for something else? And you say, what is that something else? What does it represent today? And how are things nowadays similar to what's expressed on the libretto? Or are you trying to just stick to the words in the, on the page and show that with the tools and techniques that you have available today. And I, th I think those are the two things. And the one that the Patrice Chavot, Pierre Boulet sort of approach 
of reinterpreting, using it, the text as a metaphor for something else, is one that you see much more prevalent in Europe, and the one that's represented by the Met production with Günther schneider Simpson and Otto Schenk is one that tends to be more popular here. That's sort of my observation. Uh, I hope others share that. Uh, some years ago, uh, at La Scala, uh, Franco Zeffirelli designed a production of Aida, which really was a museum piece. He went back to original designs when Aida was brand new at La Scala, and just simply recreated them, complete with bustles for the, uh, uh, the, sing the women. Uh, you know, now, that really was a museum piece. Do we want to do that? And I'm inclined to say no on that. One has to find a sort of a happy medium. Uh, I'm very impressed by the Shiro uh, interpretation of it. Yeah, yeah. There, there are merits to, to, to either approach. And um, I think even one that does not reinterpret can still be incredibly impactful to the audience. Uh, you know, you're not trying to explain something with something else. Like, uh, one of the thing that's often called the Achilles heel of the libretto is this whole business about the, the magic potion that turns Siegfried into this dud who doesn't recognize his own bride anymore. Um, you know, does that stand for something else? Does that stand for, you know, him getting infected by society, uh, by the appeal of, of a new woman, in this case Gudrun? What, what does that stand for? Because just on face value, that's, that's, that seems kind of weak in the, in the story. It seems like a weak target for criticism. And um, if, you, if you try to explain that in different ways, you know, how get people corru get corrupted? How do they forget what they were originally about, what, they, what, what is good and true within them and where they've been before and gets them on the wrong path? There are various things that that we all experience all the time, that, that make us make wrong decisions. And you can, you can use that approach to explain that. And it will not be what's written in the libretto. So you depart from that, but for good reason. And um, so there's, there's, there's great merit in going that way. But you don't have to. There's still the, the more regular version that is also incredibly powerful. All right, we have about 10 minutes left. Yes. I just would like to comment. I'm a very simple opera goer, and I probably don't appreciate all, but yet I'm still achieving that. But when you see the departures, and you see these productions sometimes, and you see the Meister singer in a stadium or something like that, I, for some reason, I, I, I have a difficult time. It's sort of somewhat overwhelming. It, the, the story in itself as it was presented hundred years ago is fascinating enough and then when they change it and they put something in a hospital scene or, or in a, um, a stadium or something that's something that it's difficult for me to buy into. Any comments from panel experts on that? So how you might better to able to appreciate the interpretation? Right, right. Question. Okay. How how would how would what would you advise? Well, I think what what, what Charles was talking about in his first question, um, knowing knowing that the words, the text, uh, that's a good start. I think you know, for as a beginner, and and uh, going on to maybe a kind of global score if you wish. Um, when watching it. Um, Live though, uh, the time does change. I, I've talked to lots of people about that, and it's the same when you're performing it. Time is different, quite a bit different. Um, and uh, I think surrendering to that, understanding that you know it, what he's saying, if we were just saying, it would take a lot less time to speak. But because it's music, it's time is a little bit slower. But when when you're done, you can't believe that six hours have gone by. Yeah. And and it's like it 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 I've gone I've been in productions of abduction which I felt like they were just never going to end. <laughs> um, it was like by the time I sang only really three and three, I was can we just cut it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 
so I, yeah, I think that surrender to the moment, I think, is the best way. Not, don't be too cerebral. Yeah. Go with the flow. Just let the emotion. Okay. okay. But, but do the work beforehand that he suggests. Right. Uh, I, would, I think that's very good advice. Wagner is, is, is one composer who especially, really, to get a full amount out of it, it really demands some research. And, that, and that's partly why we, we started the Wagner Society of Cincinnati, was to provide a vehicle, an educational vehicle, to better understand the works uh, that are very <coughs> com complex, they're full of metaphor, um, they, you know, to really research them prior, as, as Charles suggests, will add a whole another layer or two to your actual theater experience when you actually go to see the opera. I mean, we, we've been living proof of it over the course of the past two years. We've studied together as a group, and, and uh, it's been, it has yielded a lot. And it's yielded this panel discussion today, which has really been very informative. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, these, these gentlemen uh, volunteer to, to help us in our further study of what is, without a doubt, a very vast subject. So I, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes? Uh, I'm David Mach, and my question is for all panel. Given the capacity of the Met to put on productions, how would you critique the current Met ring production as compared to any measuring stick you'd like? I, I'd hope for something more than just the machinery, but I, obviously that's part of it. I, I haven't seen it, actually. But I, I did hear one story that my friend Eric Owens told me, and it actually doesn't follow the scenery. He was uh, standing on something, and uh, it was moving up, and apparently it was going to go like this. And he was supposed to get done singing, and then walk to an edge, and then you know have a ladder and go down. But it started going up before he was done singing. And by the time by the time he was done, there was no way he could get to the ladder to go down, and so. <laughs> Eric Owens actually says this funnier than I do because he's, you know, saying a few swear words here and there. Uh, and, <laughs> and he's like, okay, I guess I've got to, you know, and he's pretty high up. I mean, it, I maybe not that high, but he realizes that he's going to have to start backing up because there's a hinge here and then it, it's, he's going to have to slide down this on his rear end. Uh, he used different words. And, uh, <laughs> so sure enough, he gets done and he's backing up, he's backing up, he's turning around and, and he has to slide down it before it gets completely vertical. He gets down, he goes with the stage manager. He says, I don't remember exactly what he said. He said, uh, you need to work on the timing of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I was at the same dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I was, it was hilarious. I was laughing my head off. It was a wonder he, he even got down safe. Yeah, he is was still walking, so yeah. You know, <laughs> well, it's, just, it's, it's not just the current production that has problems. The the uh, the vine being held to guard Baroness was injured during the immolation scene, when hurt somebody's timing was off. Because if you've seen the final scene, the building collapses; these big blocks come down, and she had to be underneath of them and through. But some of them fell and hit her, and she was injured uh, during the performance. So older productions do have their problems. I think one just simply has to surrender to what it is and not over-intellectualize it. Uh, the, the prologue and first act of Gatha Dermo is two and a half hours long. That's longer than Toss can put together. <laughs> Amy, it didn't take any time at all. It was just an absolute instant of time, but what a wonderful instant of time. All right, I have one final question. That's the nice thing about being the moderator. You can fire <laughs> off the final question. And, and, and that is, of course, those of us who have seen, who have been so fortunate to be able to see and sit through a, a, a ring cycle, or even have seen all of the operas in sequence over a long period of time, or just have seen them on a DVD or whatever, um, you always have this, this feeling at the end, at the final immolation scene at the end of the entire ring cycle. Um, and so I would, I would ask um, uh, you all uh, the very broad-based question. What impact do you think the composer intended for you to have at the end, the absolute end of this monumental, gigantic ring cycle? 
absolute catharsis. The, I have a theory, strictly subjective. Look at the last chord of the ring cycle, how long it is. It is just so sustained. Two things. I think Wagner realized this is the end of something I've been working on for over a quarter of a century. I don't want to give it up. And also, I think he intended the audience needs that very long moment just to clear the air, to just come down back to earth, so to speak. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great moment. Uh, the day that Wagner finished writing the Ring Cycle, he of course was extremely emotional, he had an argument with his wife Cosima. And he was very repentant about that. And a couple days later, he wrote a piece that's been reported by Georg Scholze, but I have never seen anybody else, and I've never seen any uh, CD version of this. It was out on LP. It's called Kinter Patimus, a children's catechism. Uh, catechism. And it's a little children's choir doing words on Cozy Mai. Kozama was his wife, cozy month of May, and just with piano accompaniment, it's very like two minutes long, and then he has the orchestra just burst in with the final, final bars of the ring cycle, the redemption of the world through love. And that was his gift to Kozama. Oh. Okay, very good. Let's give them a round of applause.